through higher education, specialized education to pursue careers in industry, government, and academia as business entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, and knowledge entrepreneurs. We have Farooq Mistry, Professor Farooq Mistry, who will be the moderator for this program. There are a number of trusts granting scholarships to students by way of outright grants and loans. Parents should realize that education is not an expense to deal with, rather it is an investment. An investment in knowledge always pays the highest returns. Going through life is earning, but growing through life is learning. Today we have a distinguished panel of speakers from well-established trusts in India and Hong Kong who will provide details of their scholarship programs. This is one of a kind program and I'm very happy to say that we have had the maximum number of people logging in and registering. So good luck to all of you and enjoy the session. Thank you. And I hand over the mic to Farooq Mistry. Thank you, Farooq. Uh, the fourth, we, this is the, the, the fourth in a series of conversations that we've had. So, so we have two more coming up. On the 17th of January, 2021, uh, uh, we, the theme that uh, we'll be talking about is getting the most of college experience, building your network and selling yourself. Selling yourself is extremely important and you sell yourself in many ways. One is writing a statement of purpose that uh, Ravi Shankar will talk about uh, uh, more today. The second is being able to interview. The third is uh, uh, putting together a CV and things along those lines. The panelists are going to be Zina Vari, Zenar Marolia, who you will meet today, and Nazneen Mistri. On the 21st of February, uh, we are going to have another webinar, and that's on being happy as a Zoroastrian graduate student away from home. And the panelists for that are Farsi Navari, uh, who is a educator uh, based in the United States, Karishma Koka, who, who uh, is a scientist uh, based in London, and Hoshidar Polar, who is uh, in, in, in the human resource area in Canada. Thank you. So the next slide, please. So it's important, in, in, on this slide, I want to frame how we are going to organize today's webinar. Uh, uh, we are planning to finish uh, within 90 minutes, and so we want to get the most out of it. So the first segment is, what is this webinar all about? And that's what I'm doing right now. Each panelist will have two minutes to introduce themselves, or Farooq Rustamji will introduce to, to uh, each panelist. Then. Each panelist will talk for about 10 minutes. And during this time, we are not, uh, uh, please don't ask questions, put them up in the chat. And Karishma will take a look at the questions. And when we come to moderate, we will, uh, we will, we will uh, uh, refer the questions to the appropriate panelist. Uh, after, the, after the panelists have finished their talk, uh, uh, Zenar Marolia will synthesize as to what he's taken away from this uh, conversation and invite you to ask questions for clarification. That is questions for clarification. These questions are directed to a panelist saying, aha, uh, Ravi Shankar, you mentioned something about a statement of purpose. What does a statement of purpose mean? Or what do you mean by this or that? So it is a directed question to the panelist. And after that, we're going to have uh, 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 open mic essentially for about 30 minutes and you can ask any question to anybody uh, 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 who, who you see on the screen. But again, we prefer that these questions come through the chat and uh, uh, we take it from there. Next slide, please. So what are we about? Uh, Farah Krustamji has given you the overview. Uh, it's the World Zoroastrian Chamber of Commerce in partnership with the Zarathustri faculty in academia, envision empowering Zarathustri students to learn how to create economic, cultural, and intellectual wealth. It is in this way that we get connected to the World Zoroastrian Chamber of Commerce, whose focus is on the creation of economic wealth uh, and also social wealth. And the faculty network comes along for the creation of intellectual wealth. The mission is to facilitate Zoroastrian youth through higher and specialized education to pursue careers in industry, government, and academia, 
as business entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, and knowledge entrepreneurs. And these webinars are meant to be conversations. So after, uh, you, uh, after you've had this conversation with us, uh, uh, we've given you uh, email addresses, things like that. You can reach out to us and we will get back to you and continue the conversation with you. Uh, this initiative is supported by the RD Setna Scholarship and uh, the information is given below. Thank you, Yazdi. Next one. Uh, we have now. So, so I pass it on to Farooq Rustamji to introduce Nevo Shroff. Thank you, Farooq. We now have a very distinguished speaker, Nevis Shroff, who is the J Justice of Peace and is currently the CEO of Shroff and Company Limited, a Hong Kong based trading and manufacturing company established in 1950, which provides a range of household products and services to various markets globally. Having been brought up in Hong Kong, he completed his secondary education there before completing his tertiary. Uh, tertiary education in UK, Neville has an MBA from the University of Warwick. In Hong Kong, Neville is involved in many business and charitable organizations. He is currently on the board of directors of the prestigious Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce and member of Hong Kong Housing Society and Investment Committee. In addition, Neville is the vice chairman of the Royal Commonwealth Society in Hong Kong, a charitable organization whose patron is Queen Elizabeth II. He is also a director of the Hong Kong Tuberculosis, Chest and Heart Diseases Association and on the governing board of the Ratanji Hospital. Neville is the president and managing director of the Zoroastrian Association, Zoroastrian Char Charitable Trust of Hong Kong, Canton and Macau. Neville was awarded the title of Justice of Peace by the Hong Kong government in 2015 in recognition of his business and charitable contributions to Hong Kong community. I now hand over the mic to Neville to say about his, to talk about his scholarship program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farouk. Um, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Farouk. Um, just a little bit about me that I didn't mention, or Farouk has not mentioned, is the fact that I actually trained as a virologist, and I could have been quite useful today in, uh, in COVID-19. But I gave up my scientific training in molecular genetics and virology to go into business and go into the family business. And so this is just an indication of what a, an initial training can do and what you can do afterwards. Um, as Farouk mentioned, that I, today I'm representing the Zoroastrian Charity Funds of Hong Kong, Canton, and Macau. Um, this is the oldest trust outside of India in the world. We are established in 1874 in Hong Kong. Our goal has been to support and help charitable projects wherever they are needed, including providing relief and assistance to the destitute and distressed people. Our vision is to promote the well being of our Zoroastrian community, including support in cases of education, medical needs, hardship, etc. Now, uh, the type of funding that we provide is basically loans. We only provide loans for overseas students for postgraduates. So in other words, if you're going for postgraduate studies, you're, you're most welcome to apply to us. We do not provide loans to undergraduate studies overseas, but we do, however, provide donations if you are studying in India, not only for schooling, but for undergraduate courses, but this is only in India. So if you want to apply to us as an early student, you have to apply uh, as it as a loan rather than as a donation or a scholarship or a grant. Now the amount that we do is we provide a loan of US dollars six, uh, 5,000, sorry, to students in USA and Canada for Europe. 
we provide 4,000 euros as a loan if you want to study, for example, in Holland or Germany or France, Belgium, wherever it may be. For the UK, we provide 4,000 pounds per year. So if your course, postgraduate course is one or two years, we'll provide you that per year. For Australia and New Zealand, we will provide 5,000 Australian dollars. Um, the, num the number of, of awardees that we provide this uh, scholarship for is we provide on an annual basis, a minimum of about 80 students doing postgraduate work overseas. We provide a significant more in India alone for people studying uh, in schools, for people whose parents are in need of funds. Our conditions are that you must satisfy the criteria as per our form, which needs to be filled up. You can get this form from myself. The form and questionnaire then needs to be returned back to our trustees for deliberation. We would then need to see the financial status of the family to ensure that they are deserving of our financial support. We have had people filling up forms and when we've asked them for their financial statements from the parents, they're worth, some of them are, are worth crows of rupees, so to speak. So obviously we would not su uh, support those people. The students on top of that should sh obviously show strong academic, uh, not strong academic background to pursue the course that they have applied for. We do not discriminate against any courses. So including the arts, culture, music, culinary, as I just heard earlier, any of these courses, we don't just emphasize on the normal standard type of courses of science, engineering, business, law, etc. Medicine, we do support medical students as well. But we also support the arts, culture, and music. We would like to emphasize that the most important thing we feel is that we put trust in the applicant to show honesty and integrity to return back the loan that they borrow from us so that we are able to support other students. The funds that we give for the loans will only be sent directly, directly to the university concerned and not to the individual applicant. So these are some of our basic conditions. May I have the next slide, please? Oh, the timeline for application. Yeah, the timeline for application is usually th minimum three months before entering the university. Um, the documents that we require for applications, as mentioned, they would need to fill up a 25 questionnaire form. So in other words, we have about 25 questionnaires, uh, questions on the form that need to be filled up. This will include a confirmation letter of admission from the university for the course that they're embarking on. We would also need a personal bio data of the applicant, including a statement of purpose. In the statement of purpose, we would be looking not only at the academic achievements, but also we will be looking at their different attributes to society, including the extracurricular activities. Basically, we would like to see students showing an all round education as opposed to somebody specifically on academia. We would like to see students showing an, showing an ability that they are able to not only perform in, in academia, but in anything like music, uh, sports, etc. In the statement of purpose, we'd like the applicant to be able to explain why they chose that particular course and career path what they see as the future challenges and opportunities. And if they have a, applied to any other trusts and what amounts, 
has been approved. My contact uh, information, I think, has been already been given. You can, I think you can see it on the slide. So if anybody wants to contact me for, for a loan studying overseas, they may contact me at the email address that's been given there. And uh, I will supply them with a form that they will need to fill up with various other information that will be needed. So back to you, Farouk. Thank you very much. Farouk, you're on mute. Farouk, you're on mute. you're on mute. Yeah, thank you very much, Neville, for the talk that you gave on your scholarship program. Thank you. And now the next speaker is TJ Ravishankar, who is the director of the JN Tata Endowment for Higher Education of Indians and head individual grants program, Education Tata Trust. He has been with the JN Tata Endowment since July 2015 and also manages various domestic and overseas scholarship programs and other initiatives in Tata Trusts. Prior to this, he was with the TCS engaged in research. He spent 16 years in teaching and about five years in business journalism with Business India and the Economic Times. He has been a senior guest faculty at the Xavier's Institute of Communication for several years. He undertook the research and basic training for a book on Ramnath Goenka, promoter of Indian Express and contributed to the first Indian edition of the UK based super brand. He holds two master's degrees in MCOM and MA in philosophy. With this, I request Mr. Ravishankar to talk about his scholarship program. Thank you. Thanks, Rustamji. So I'll just start with a very basic slide of uh, what uh, Jamshedji said when he set up the Jain Tata Endowment in 1892, which is a very unique approach to uh, philanthropy, something which does not normally come across. So it's very useful to take a look at this and understand why he chose to help people who are gifted and talented, and we've been following the same thing. Yeah, yeah, next slide, please. So we have got a scholarship, uh, which is a one-time scholarship. Uh, it's either at the beginning of your studies, or this is only for overseas studies, not for domestic studies. And you have to be a graduate of, uh, you must have an undergrad from an, an Indian university. So, so master's, PhD, postdoctoral, even a six-month fellowship is also available here. We offer between one lakh to 10 lakhs of rupees. And if you get chosen as a Jain Tata scholar, you get a travel grant up to these 50,000 rupees. And you are entitled to a gift scholarship, which can go up to 750,000. But that's based on your academic performance. Yeah? And the loan, it's a loan scholarship, which is usually repaid from the end of the third year and the seventh year in equal installments of 20%. Yeah? May I? Next slide, please. You, as I said, you have to be a, an undergrad from this country. If you have done an undergrad from a foreign university, you're not eligible to apply for the JN Tata Endowment. Yeah. And it's a merit-based scholarship, highly competitive. See, if you have not got a 60% of the undergrad, it's very difficult that you'll stand a chance of getting this scholarship. Yeah. So last year, we introduced a modification that if you have missed the uh, advertisement at the beginning of your master's and you're doing a two-year master's, then you can apply for the second year. So that's why he said like the fall 21 is already on, on the JN Tata Endowment website. Yeah? So if you're doing a PhD and you've come to know about it after one and a half semester, one year, as long as you have at least two semesters to go, you can still apply to the JN Tata Endowment. This is a modification which you made last year. So even if you're a working professional till the age of 45, as on June, you're still eligible to apply. We don't make a distinction between uh, any of this. You're welcome to choose whatever you wish to study. Yeah? Next slide, please. I will skip this. I think you can take a look at, the, uh, at our website for this. 
data. So this is why I this is what I wanted to actually speak about. It's not a question of how good you are, but how good you are relative to others. So often people say that I did very well. You must have done extremely well, but someone did better. We receive about 1,200 applications, out of which the initial shortlist is about 450 or 500 people who are shortlisted for an online test. From out of which we interview about shortlist about 275 people for an interview. From out of 275 people, about 100 people get chosen uh, for the final uh, award. So it's very difficult uh, to get this scholarship. It's very prestigious. So if you have, if you aim to get this, you have to prepare yourself for this. So uh, may may go to the baseline. So the most important thing is that if you have done a DRE and if you have not got a good score. I will suggest that you do it again, try and get a better score. Otherwise, you, the chances of getting is very low. So it, one of the things that in mean, my experience I have found students uh, wanting is in the writing, writing of the statement of purpose. Most students tend to make it biographical. They read about where they were born, what did they do, what did their parents do, not at all relevant. So you focus, it's an intellectual, it's an academic document. What we want to understand is, as I said, it's a statement of purpose. Why have you chosen to study what you wish to study? There must be some logic. You cannot just say, let me take the example of uh, robotics. You cannot just say that the world is moving very fast, artificial intelligence taking over. You can't make this kind of grand motherhood statement. It will not get you any point at all. You have to be very specific. Uh, today, if you, have, if you even reasonably stay in touch with the subject, you realize that there is no subject like a robotics. So somebody would be studying uh, wheeled robotics, somebody studying leg robotics, somebody studying alternate vehicle, somebody studying vertical mo motion. So you have to be very precise in your understanding and articulation of why. You know, uh, especially when it comes to technology, most students write very generally and they lose out. So sometimes you may be shifting away from your undergrad exam. Suppose you have done mechanical engineering. Now you're moving to say something completely different. It's perfectly fine. But you should be able to explain why are you shifting out of a recognized discipline into something else. So we've had students moving from uh, uh, engineering to literature or to philosophy, to linguistics. It's fine. But we just want to know why you have made this choice. A general awareness of what you're likely to do once you finish your academic education is very important. You have to understand one thing. It's extremely expensive to study overseas unless you study in uh, Europe. If you went to Germany, the fees are very reasonable. Only the living cost that you have to take care of. Yeah? Generally, Europe is cheaper as compared to the US and the UK. Even Ireland is very cheap. I have put together a document of scholarships available in major countries. I will mail that to... Uh, and then anybody can take a look at it afterwards. So we have an online test. It's called as thinking skills assessment. We've been doing it for the last two years as a way of filtering because we have too many students and we can't interview all of them. Most students don't take it seriously. And you have enormous amount of material available. If you just spend 10 minutes on this in Google or any search engine that you wish to do, you will find enormous amount of stuff. It's a one hour test. Uh, it's it's multiple choice. There are some numerical questions. You don't expect you to be some Einstein or some great mathematician. It's basic arithmetic that you should know. But do prepare. And uh, the last thing we do is an interview, which is very rigorous. So we have subject experts from very IITs, EIFRs. We even have experts from subjects from foreign universities now. University of Rotterdam, University of Southern California. Massachusetts, Australia. So the interviews, you should take it very seriously. You should come prepared. Most students don't do it. They have lost touch with their subject. But you will be asked questions on what you have studied at the undergrad and what you wish to study. We don't expect you to be an expert in uh, what you wish to study. But we want to know at least are you aware of what you're going to study. And when you write the statement of purpose, please be honest. Do not write something that someone else has written for you or someone else has said, because you will be, you will be found out in the interview. Always write something that you can defend, something that you are sure about, something that you are confident, something that you've actually done. Uh, 
Yeah. Please take it seriously. Yeah. Next. Next slide. Yeah. This is our address. Uh, you can send a mail here. The application process is completely online. Not a single scrap of paper. And there is no fee charge, so you can just. It's already on for the current four two and seven. It's already on. Okay. Thank you, Rasmi. Thank you, Ravi Shankar, for this enlightening talk about your scholarship program. Uh, the next presenter of the scholarship program is uh, Ryan Pereira. Is the regional officer at the United States. India Educational Foundation, where he supervises both the Education USA and Fulbright programs in Western India. Ryan has over nine years' experience guiding students interested in pursuing higher studies in the United States. Prior to that, Mr. Pereira taught various courses in molecular biology, biotechnology, and Saint Xavier's College, Mumbai. During the period 2009-2010, Mr. Pereira was a postdoctoral fellow, research and associate in the Department of Molecular Medicine at the Cornell University, where he trained with Dr. Richard Serion. Originally from Mumbai, he has a B.Sc. in Zoology, Biochemistry from the Saint Xavier's College, Mumbai, an M.Sc. in Biochemistry from Mumbai University and a PhD in biochemistry from the Ohio State University. I request Ryan to now talk about his scholarship program to the students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farooq Rasmiji. So uh, I want to start by saying two things. The first is I want to thank Farooq Rasmiji and Farooq, Professor Farooq Mistri and the others for including me in this talk. I think it's a very, very good initiative. One of the goals of the US mission is to encourage the minorities to pursue higher studies in the US. So I was all over this, so grateful for this opportunity to present with y'all. Second point I would want to make is I am so thrilled to see that diversity of the students who are attending today's talk, all the way from 10th graders to people who want to pursue PhDs and people who are coming back to study after having children. So it's such a wonderful, wonderful, uh, it's thrilling to be part of this presentation. I'm gonna talk about the Fulbright program. Uh, let's talk about uh, Senator Fulbright. This program was started by Senator Fulbright, a US Senator in 1946. And the goal behind this program was 1946, soon after the World War II, the world was torn apart. So Senator Fulbright had this vision of bringing people from various countries to the US so that they could learn about the US and then go back to their home countries and help build a better, closer knit global world. So the vision is mutual understanding between the people of India and the US. That's what the Fulbright program is all about. And the funding for this Fulbright program comes from both the Indian government and the US government. We have a various num a large number of Fulbright fellowships. I'm going to talk about just two that are relevant for the students. First one is the Fulbright Nehru Masters Fellowship. The application deadline is going to be all, it's usually around May 15th of each year. So we, are, we are predicting it will be May 15th, 2021. There are just 10 fields that are supported under the master's fellowship. So we have arts and culture management, higher education administration, environmental science and studies, urban and regional planning. And I know we had an architecture student out there before. Uh, women's studies, economics, international relations, international law, public health, and public administration. One of the, if we had to just, this grant gives up to $80,000 funding over the two years of a master. So it pays your tuition, uh, 
almost complete tuition through years masters so if we had to keep this open for all master students we'd get way way too many applications so we do have a criteria that you have to have 3 years work experience to be eligible for this masters fellowship okay. next slide the fulbright nehru doctoral research fellowship is meant for people indians who are registered for their phd at an indian institute and they should have been in that phd program for at least one year and this grant gives you the opportunity of going to a us university or research lab for anywhere between 6 to 9 months uh, where you can get advanced training and then come back to india and complete your phd the deadline is usually uh, mid july but this moves around it's one of those grants that moves around sometimes it's may sometimes it's july uh where for this next cycle of the fulbright fellowships we are going to be making the announcement in january so please check the websites for the specific details about the eligibility criteria the fields that are supported and the application deadline next slide so in the doctoral fellowships we support a much larger uh, range of fields all the way from agricultural sciences to visual arts sociology public health and education policy and planning so and even if your specific area is not on this list of fields that are supported doesn't mean you cannot apply what you need to do is fit your proposal your research proposal into one of these areas so you have to be able to explain how your research is relevant to one of these areas it doesn't have, just because you're doing a phd in biochemistry doesn't mean you cannot apply you have to be you can't fit it into environmental science but explain what is the relevant impact to for the environment in your with your project next slide the timeline that we have is this is a very very like uh, ravi shankar spoke about with the tata scholarships the entire scholarships fulbright fellowships are also extremely competitive we get about uh, 1500 applications and we give out about 100 uh, fellowships per year about 10 of those will be for the masters fellowship and about 20 will be for the doctoral fellowships the process of the selections takes one year so we start with announcing the programs usually in january next the application deadlines are usually or they'll always be mid may for the masters and for some of the very seniors it can go up to mid september next slide once we receive the applications then there's a two step process involved the subject experts will screen all the applications in that particular subject so say you're a mechanical engineer and you or you're applying for one of the bioengineering programs so all the applications that we get in the doctoral programs for bioengineering will be looked at by two subject experts in the field and they will rate the applications individually and we will collate their ratings and get the highest level the top scores next slide so the highest rated candidates will be shortlisted for interviews which are usually held in delhi this year we did them virtually and they went off quite well so these interviews are usually in august or november next slide next once the shortlisted candidates and the interviews have been taken place those that have been selected their applications are sent to the us and their our partner in the us will look at the placements of the and and do the 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 documentation that's required from us side next once that's done we will issue the terms of the grant which usually happens between may and uh, may late next the following year next and once we get the grants we will also issue you a ds2019 and with that ds2019 we will process the j1 visa for you 
and you leave for your study around July after you get the visa, between July and August. So it takes a full one year. So we want you to start thinking about this process well in advance. Look and see what are the fields that are supported. Look and see how you can put your research proposal or your study proposal into one of those areas. As I mentioned, it is a very uh, uh, rigorous program and there's a lot of competition. The criteria that is used to select candidates will always be the academic credentials and the professional ability of the candidates. But since this is funded by both the Indian government and the US government, we want to know what is the merit of the project, both in terms of India and for the US. And since they're paying you to go to the US, what is the need to conduct this research in the US? I'll give you an example. Uh, we had somebody who was talking about, oh, I want to go to the US to do two years of postdoctoral research. And the first object of the proposal was to make uh, cell lines. And they said, but you can make cell lines in India. Why do you need to be in the US for that? Okay. So when you're thinking about your proposal, think about all these aspects. Uh, does this research that you have, does it need to be in the US? Talk about the potential of the impact and the outcomes. We're also going to look at the motivation and the seriousness of the person, of the candidate. As I mentioned, the overarching goal of Fulbright is mutual understanding between India and US, the people of India and US. So we want to know whether you can act as a cultural ambassador. Now, you don't have to have fancy uh, dance skills and things like that. Everybody can participate to act as a cultural ambassador. Can you contribute uh, talking about Indian culture, sharing Indian culture with the US people? Okay. That's what we're going to look at. Uh, we're also going to look at your communication skills. And since this is a J-1 visa where you have to come back to India for two years, we want to make sure that you have a commitment to serve the community and the nation. So it is a rigorous program. It is challenging to get this Fulbright. It is a very prestigious award, but I strongly encourage you all to try it. Okay. Next slide. Over to you, Faru. You're still muted, Faru. Thank you, Ryan, for your presentation on your program. Very interesting and useful to students for, from India to US. Thank you. Now, I would like to talk about the scholarship program at the RD Setna Scholarship Fund. This, our scholarships are funded from our own trust funds and we conduct one of the oldest well-respected loan scholarship programs assisting outstanding and deserving Indian students of all communities. The loan scholarship program was initiated in or around 1938 after the demise of Mr. Rustam D. Setna, a Parsi Zoroastrian Indian philanthropist. Mr. Setna's approach to philanthropy was during his lifetime directed to specific cause of higher education for the promotion and encouragement of scientific, technical, industrial, and commercial instruction or education in ways beneficial to society. After his demise, his philanthropy lives on as reflected in the work of the R.D. Setna Scholarship Fund. The scholarship program encapsulates noble ideals of R.D. Setna for granting financial assistance to Indian students to broaden their academic interests and in turn benefit the nation. The R.D. Setna scholarships are investments in young citizens to empower the pursuit of their academic interests and careers. Loan scholarships are granted on the basis of meritorious performance to facilitate payment of tuition fees, academic material, and related expenses for enhancing the education experience. 
Our loan scholarships need to be repaid with a 2% interest per annum, such that monies can be utilized for other such scholars. It is a matter of pride that the vision of the RD Setna for the cause of education for all Indians has and continues to benefit brighter and better India, for a brighter and better India. Now I'll take you through the important application information. We normally had an application form, which was a physical form and you could collect it from the office, either personally or by post, fill it in, sub give the supporting documents and return them to us. But during this lockdown period and the COVID-19, we took the opportunity to go online and completely prepare a website from scratch for the students to make their applications online. And the system is working very well and we are processing applications which we receive online. There are also other applicants who are not that computer savvy and those applicants collect forms from us and we also consider those physical forms. The applications are invited from students of all communities who are Indian citizens for grant of loan scholarships for scientific, technical, medical and other professional courses in India and overseas. At the time of submitting the applications, the candidate has to ensure inter alia that a guarantor being a resident of Mumbai has to stand guarantee for the repayment of the loan scholarship amount granted. In addition, the candidate is required to obtain the written recommendation of two persons being resident in Mumbai who are familiar with the candidate in support of his candidate's application. After the loan scholarship is sanctioned, but prior to its disbursement thereof in tranches, the candidate is required to provide an insurance policy either from the Life Insurance Corporation or the Tata Insurance Company through its registered agents as collateral guarantee for the amount of the loan scholarship granted, which insurance policy shall stand assigned to the trustees. We Further, we also have a special loan scholarship for a two years master's program in engineering or data sciences culminating in a doctorate degree. The scholar would be admitted to the University of Oklahoma, USA, provided he or she meets with the criteria of the university and the selection committee. The scholar will be under the mentorship of Professor Farouk Mistry in the areas of mechanical engineering industrial engineering or data sciences. The scholar would be selected after an intense interview, scrutiny and will be mentored based on their academic performance, constructive service to the Zoroastrian community in the past and that spirit of selflessness to make a meaningful difference in the lives of the people they touch. The scholar would be expected to pay back the scholarship grant in a reasonable period after graduation, such that monies can be utilized for other scholars. The application forms are issued from 1st April to 15th May each year. The duly completed application forms should reach the trust office not later than 31st May for studies overseas and by 31st August for studies in India. However, this year, due to the unforeseen circumstances, we have relaxed the timelines for applying. So with that, I end my presentation on the scholarship program and look forward to answering any questions that you may have for me. I hand over the mic to Professor Mistry for further discussion. Thank you very much. Professor Mistry. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, hi. Sir. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to say uh, thank you to all the wonderful speakers that we had.
uh, and the panelists. Uh, like I said, I wish this. <laughs> I wish we had got this information when I was started leaving India uh, about half of the. Well, one and a half decades ago. So just a bit about me. Uh, I'm based in London in, in the UK. I've uh, done my primary and secondary education in India, uh, in Bombay, actually. Uh, then studied a degree in civil engineering from the University of Nottingham. Went to Cambridge, did a master's degree in interdisciplinary design, and finally did an MBA from the University, uh, from the London School of Economics. So I've, I've got the engineering side and the business side and, and the sort of design side uh, of, of the built environment industry. Uh, I'm now a property developer based in the UK. So I've opened my own business. So uh, from being an academic entrepreneur, I've also now uh, opened up my own sort of business entrepreneurship endeavor. Uh, I'm, I'm a director of my own company and my plan for the future, uh, I know this surprises quite a few people, is to return back home to Bombay uh, as an entrepreneur. And uh, uh, my, the, 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 the original goal was to develop India uh, through sort of infrastructure and, and create that infrastructure in India where we can rival the world. So that's a bit about me. Uh, I think the main things that I'd like to start is by saying that if you could ask any questions for clarification. So if you have any questions directly for the panelists, uh, the three wonderful panelists uh, that, that, that presented today, Mr. Ravi Shankar, Mr. Ryan Pereira, and uh, obviously Mr. Neville Shroff, if you have any direct questions for them, please do put it in the chat box. Uh, you have to understand as well that uh, what is the vision of the program, what is the importance of the program, whether it's a loan program, whether it's a scholarship program, and the main thing is preparation for that scholarship application. As you can see, that there will be a lot of people applying and there'll be a lot of competition and we should never shy away from competition. So there'll be over 1,200 people or 1,500 people uh, who've got broadly similar sort of achievements, broadly similar sort of academic backgrounds. And how do, you, how do you stand out? What makes you different? What makes you special? And how do you align with the vision of the, of the program or the scholarship advisory uh, body that will be awarding you that, that loan? So ensure that you prepare properly, ensure that you prepare in time and see the listed criteria. Some of the criteria are an open criteria. So it could be any sort of faculty, any sort of subject that you would like to uh, study. While some of them are very specific for technical, scientific or STEM based subjects. Some of them are just for master's programs. Some of them are just for PhD programs. So you have to really understand and get down into the depths of what the vision is, what is the program and how can you best align with that. So base your choice on your passion and pay attention to your statement of purpose. The statement of purpose is about you. Why do you want to study what you are trying to study? Why do you want to go abroad to that particular country or to that particular university of your choice? Why is it that you need to go there and you cannot get that same opportunity or that academic achievement like Mr. Ryan Pereira gave a great example about uh, you know, cell lines in India? You can do that in India, you can do that in Mumbai. Why do you need to go abroad? So just, just understand the purpose of why. Why that country, why that university? I think that really helped me in my statement of purpose. And finally, be prepared to articulate why you've chosen that and why is that degree going to help you and also in some cases help wider society? Because it's not only about ourselves, you have to understand how, what part you will pay in the society or in the world or in developing your country or your community and how that is important for yourself in the years to come ahead. So Farooq, do we have any questions for clarifications uh, in the chat box? Yes, uh, uh, I can take it from there. Okay. Great, uh, thank you all very much. We have four panelists and I'm very grateful to them. And I'm very grateful to Farooq Rustamji for having organized uh, this uh, webinar. Zainal, thank you very much. You hit the nail on the head in terms of the key points. And in this sec segment, uh, so, so, so what I want to do before we go into op uh, the open mic area is to deal with issues that have come up in the chat box. And Karishma is helping me uh, put the list together and so far, I have picked up six uh, points. Dilshad Kapadia, a PhD for people over 45. Taira Marshall, there's a tax levied on Indian students studying abroad. 
Burgess doctor to Farooq Rustamji, tell us more about the insurance policy. Karen Pitawala, uh, loan, uh, does the loan scholarship uh, cover living expenses in the US? Delna Balsara, scholarship for US students who wish to study abroad. And uh, uh, there's one by, uh, 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 I forget who, uh, who says, uh, are there scholarships for undergraduates going abroad? So let's start with the first one. Uh, can we stop sharing the screen so I can see see who's who? Yeah. So, so uh, Dilshad Kapadia, uh, PhD for people over 45 years. Would the panelists like to address that? Who would like to address that? Anybody who wants to. Yeah. So, so who would like to address that? It's open for anybody who has that information. Dilshad. I am asking the panelists as to which one would like to address it. Keep quiet. So for Go the ahead. Aim Tata Go endowment, ahead. it doesn't matter whether you're doing a PhD or whatever. The age limit is not more than 45 years as on 30th June of that year. So if someone is applying for fall 21, uh, that person should not be greater than 45 as on June 30, 2021. Mm -hmm. so masters, it could be PhD. Uh, we do give scholarships for PhD students also. Is there an age limit? No, there is no age limit. Great. Uh, Neville? Yeah. Um, normally, we don't give uh, loans to PhD students because many of the PhD doctorate programs provide uh, some sort of uh, um, remuneration for their, for their degree as well. Um, but uh, our age limit is 35. So I think anybody over 35 will have difficulty applying for us. We do not, we do not normally support anybody over 35. Great. For any uh, Ryan? Ryan? Uh, the Fulbright program does not have any age limit for any, for any of the fellowships. Great. So, so Dilshar, your question has been answered. Uh, Tyra Marshall. Uh, has raised the issue of tax levied on Indian students studying abroad. I have no idea uh, about taxes and stuff like that. Uh, the panelists uh, from India, do you know anything about this? Can you answer her question? I think they should check with their own chartered accountant. As far as I understand, it is not subject to the scholarship that they receive for studies is not taxable. Uh, this is my understanding. Uh, I mean, I think it comes under Section 10 of the Income Tax Act. But even in the UK, I mean, I have a student who lives in the UK. She got a scholarship from the University of Savas uh, for three years. She got 1,900 pounds a month. It was tax free. But they should check up with their own chartered accountant or any tax consultant. Thank you. Anybody else to answer that question? Arok, yes, sorry. Um, yes. I think it's it, the tax basically is not a tax. On uh, it's it's a tax on any money sent out of India. For I don't know if uh, education is exempt because I've been trying to get money sent from India over here, and I think there's like a two or three or four percent tax on money sent out of India. So I think that is where the question comes in. But you'd it's have a, to check with the chartered accountant; they a, would know the exact amount better. It's a it's a five percent TDS on money sent out of India. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I mean, these are taxes. You have to pay it. You have to live by the rules of the country. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a TDS, so you can get it. You'll get a refund on it. So that's a deduction, which is a tax deduction at source, correct? Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, but if I just can add one more thing, is that it was, uh, this is what I have read very briefly, whereby it said that if you take the uh, loan, your tax is reduced to about half a percent. But if you self-fund it, the tax is increased to 5%. This is something that you need to work with your own accountant. Uh, this is not something that we can give you advice on uh, because, because none of us are experienced in this. So I'd like to move on. Uh, we have some idea in terms of, of what's involved, but, but you really have to find out for yourself uh, from, the, uh, tax account, from, from your accountant. Uh, but just doctor to Farooq Rustamji, uh, he would like you to ex uh, say a little more about the insurance policy. 
the insurance policy is to be taken out for the amount of loan that is granted. And it has to be an endowment policy, which is assigned to the trustees and will be reassigned to the student once the loan is completely repaid. And this has to be done. Thank you, sir. Educated insurance agents who will assist you in processing your application for insurance. It's a in-house uh, support which is given to students. We have insurance uh, agent coming to our office almost every day and helping students prepare the documents for obtaining a policy. Karen Pitwala says, does the loan scholarship cover living expenses in the US? I will answer that. Uh, Karen, you have to check with the university as to what the living expenses are going to be. Uh, none of the loan scholarships, to the best of my knowledge, cover everything. Loan scholarships are supplementary. They are top-up uh, scholarships or top-up loans that you get. And, and you have to work the finances out for yourself after you have figured out which, uh, what the cost is going to be at which university. The cost varies by university, the cost varies by country, the cost varies by, uh, by the discipline in which you go, etc. So this, you have to do your homework on that. This is not something that uh, the panelists or I can answer. Uh, Delna, uh, I didn't quite understand your question, Balsara. Are there scholarships for US students who wish to study abroad? Uh, could you please clarify that question? Um, so I must, in the upcoming summer, I'll be going to New Zealand for study abroad. I was just wondering if there were any scholarships for US citizens who are studying abroad. So you're a US citizen, correct? Yeah. All right, so, so, so uh, 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 Neville, uh, would you like to answer that question? Does your trust give a loan to a US citizen who wants to study in New Zealand? Uh, I would say no, because I would say the onus here is on the Americans, right? It, this is not a, uh, you know, it's not from India where people are in need of um, funds. We ha you have a big American body called Fazana, as you know, who should be supporting their own students. But likewise, I tell ZTFE in the UK the same thing, because we do get students from America asking us for funds. We do get students from the UK asking us for funds. And I'd like to know that their own organizations in their own countries can support them. So I would say no at the moment. Great. A follow up uh, we only give our loan scholarships to Indian citizens. Great. Uh, uh, Ryan? Uh, I would recommend that the student uh, look at the Fulbright program because just like we send Indians to the US, the main Fulbright program is to send the US citizens outside. So I would definitely look at that and also look at the Fulbright uh, mission based in New Zealand see what kind of fellowships they have for US uh, students. Ravi Shankar? Uh, the entered endowment is only for Indian citizens. Great. Uh, so so uh, scholarships for undergraduates going abroad. So let me start by answering that question. Uh, I have been in the United States since 1968 and I've been a professor since 1976. And my advice to people who want to go to the United States for undergraduate studies is you shouldn't do it. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. It, the, uh, it's just not there. Now, if you are very rich and, and your parents want to come along and say, wow, my son or daughter is studying overseas, that's wonderful. But otherwise, it is my strong uh, opinion that you should do your undergraduate work in India or wherever you are in Dubai or wherever you are and then go for graduate studies. Now, having said that, this is a parochism. A parochism is a strongly held belief that others will disagree with. And so now I'm going to invite Neville, Farouk Rustamji, uh, 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 Ravi Shankar, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, go ahead, Ravi Shankar. I strongly support what he's saying that it's, I mean, I would even go to the extent of saying that it's absolutely absurd to go to the U anywhere in the U UK or the US uh, for an undergrad education, 
we have we have very good undergrad education in india in many subjects the iits now you have icel which is for science education so we have nits which used to be the regional engineering colleges earlier so it doesn't make sense to go and it's so expensive to study undergrad in the us so i mean standard liberal education would cost you upwards of 45 to 50000 dollars one year i mean how many people can afford to spend something like um, Uh, you know, two hundred thousand dollars. It's just not worth it. They should go for master. Great, uh, Farooq Rustamji, your opinion. Idal Dawa, your opinion. Uh, would, somebody from industry, your opinion. I would, I would like to answer that question about uh, undergrad studies. Yes, we do support them, but as everybody has said, the cost is huge, and like you said, if you have money to spend. then take it but all said and done we will support a student for undergraduate studies also sorry i just have a follow up question for mr farooq rustamji is that yes. right if i ask you right um so you should but would you still support the student pursuing an undergrad even if he's not studying in india so i am an indian citizen but my high school is not in india where is your high school abu dhabi uae No, you okay. should be an Indian citizen living in India. Oh, okay, thank you. Either. Yeah, I definitely would uh, second what Farooq is saying that uh, the United States is absolutely fantastic for graduate studies and uh, opportunities for research and opportunities for open thinking. So the undergraduate, it'd be a complete complete waste of money. Um, I mean, it would be good education, but you're paying way too much for it. and suggest you do it in india and then come for graduate studies to the us uh beram perspective yeah i would like to take a opposite point of view in terms of making an exception and i overall agree with the thesis however i would say that the ivy leagues like princeton and harvard they have huge endowments and if you have the merit to get into one of those ivy leagues you don't have to pay for it the the university will pay the education so i would not shut it out completely there are six or seven ivy league schools and their endowments are absolutely mind boggling and uh, i would not discourage somebody to apply for that for undergraduate i agree with you that overall the uh, there's no bang for the buck in terms of your education in undergraduation in united states it's just not worth the money overall i agree with that thesis except for the ivy league schools uh, i reinforce what baram has said uh, if you are serious about undergraduate education apply to princeton uh, uh, princeton has a program where uh, 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 about in 2005 princeton and yale uh, were uh, told by the irs that they were not spending enough of their endowment princeton decided uh, to not to increase the size of the program yale decided to increase the size of the program and and princeton decided to make education free for undergraduates and graduates so if you were admitted it would be free taken care of uh, with the great depression uh, they backed off on it and now they've started giving money again so certainly i uh, thank you baron for bringing it up apply to princeton apply to yale and see how it works out but uh, overall going to a regular state university just to say oh i i i've studied in the united states my undergraduate stuff it's not on okay just to add I'll, to that even even at the graduate level there's a medical school in new york which allows you to get your full medical education for free one philanthropist has just pulled out his pocket and said everybody ad- admitted to this medical college is going to get free medical education so such philanthropic uh, pr- positions attract the best talent if you can get into those schools the, you learn from your peers you learn more from your peers than you learn from your professors and it would be a great learning experience to get into such institutions so baram can you share your email address and what you've just said so people who are interested in medical stuff can get in touch with you yeah baram at fizana.org i will do that okay yeah uh, uh, Mer, yeah, go ahead. 
Nicole? No, there are exceptions. There's Cooper's Union in New York, which does also covers most of your costs for uh, engineering. So there are a few exceptions which you have to hunt for, you know. Uh, I can um, mention, I can Ryan, go ahead. I, I'm going to, well, I represent Education USA, so I'm going to jump on the opposite end of this. Uh, while the US education can seem to be expensive, this is a talk on financing your education. One aspect that has not been discussed yet is how can one reduce the cost of attending school? And there are multiple ways of doing that. The first is to look for best buys, ones that have relatively low tuition or le low cost of living. Uh, I keep using the example, when I was at uh, Ohio State, I had a one bedroom AC apartment, 10 minute walk from my lab for $400 a month in a 10 year old building. I then went to work in Cornell and I was paying $900 for a 100 year old building. So that's over four years, that's $24,000 one can save. There are best buys one can look for. There are also ways to accelerate your program. For the undergraduates, one can do what is called the advanced placement exams, where you could cut a full year of your undergraduate program. So you're saving one year of both tuition and living expenses. Yeah, I'm aware. For the, I mean, for I do IB, and so we. You get credits degree, for it anyway. I get, yes. Yeah, I get credits oh, for So that's what I'm trying to say. Years or like two and, okay. a half years anyway. and, and then there are also about 250 US universities that offer substantial financial aid to international students. So it's not like Barham talked about the Ivy Leagues. They have really, really good schools. No question about it. All eight of them. Uh, but there are so many other schools. And what I keep telling students who ask me about higher studies in the US is I keep telling them, Two weeks spent looking for best buys and looking for a good school is far, far better than the two months you'll spend trying to get a small scholarship. Thank you. I want to now move on. Uh, Menos Patel has said, I'm currently enrolled in MS in technology management in the US. I have one semester to go. I graduated in May 2021. What funding can I avail? I am an Indian citizen. So, so Neville, first you, I suspect it's a no, there's nothing. No, I, I think um, if it's uh, one semester, right? That, so um, the course has uh, already been nearly completed. Am I correct in assuming that? Yes. Um, if there's still time, one semester, we could possibly consider a loan. They could, uh, they could apply to us. We'll have a look at it. Great. Uh, 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 since this is only a short period left for completing the studies, I don't think they would be able to meet the uh, time schedules of our trust in terms of applying and in terms of getting the scholarship because Thank it's you. a elaborate process of selection. Uh, Ravi Shankar? Yeah, I think because uh, she's graduating in uh, May 21, we are offering for fall 21, which is, you know, September, October. So I'm afraid Thank you won't be able to send. Ryan? No, he is. He, we are currently looking at 2022. So he's definitely not. A, okay. Uh, Jehan Doctor has said, what is uh, the lead time for sanctioning these uh, loans and scholarships? I suggest, Ryan, that you go and look at the website and the information is provided after. For Mr. Ravi Shankar from Bispi Karkaria, what will be the syllabus for the test of the JN Tata scholarship, will the syllabus be general or a specific field? As I said, you know, the, they have to just look for thinking skills assessment. I shouldn't say anything beyond that. So the focus Vispi, is on how you answer questions, your intellectual personality, not necessarily your technical personality. Your technical personality is taken, uh, is, is, is uh, 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 represented by the Great point average that you get if you're doing engineering, the GRE scores that you get, the, the TOEFL scores that you get, that's from the technical side. This is to see if you have leadership potential, you know how to sell yourself, you know why you're going to do it. And the slide that Ravi Shankar has put on uh, uh, where he said what the criteria are and what the statement of purpose should be is an extremely important slide. This is for everybody. Uh, Ravi Shankar, anything to add to that? 
No, see, the, if you just went in and searched through any search engine, just search, search, type for thinking skills assessment. They'll get an enormous number of question papers that they can look at. They'll get an idea. I shouldn't say anything beyond this because it's not fair to the other students. Great. Uh, Dora Beta has asked uh, uh, Farah Ji, what is the payment schedule for loan scholarships such as the RD Setna scholarship? Do the students pay back the loan on completion of the course? Uh, we give a one-year moratorium after the completion of studies. And then you pay in installments over the next three years. So a total of four years is there for you to repay the loan scholarship. And of course, supported by an insurance policy for which the premium is paid by the student. The policy must be in force. Great. Uh, Ravi Shankar? It's a seven year process. So we start from the end of the third year. So it's equal 20% over five over a five year period from third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Or whenever they start working, whichever is the earlier one. Great. Uh, Neville? Um, we provide an interest free loan um, with no specific timeline or no specific time frame, so to speak. Um, but we depend on the integrity of the students to repay the loan whenever they're able to do so. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Ravi Shankar, this is from a gift that grows to everyone. I don't know who that is. Uh, does the Tata Trust give scholarship for aviation, commercial, private training? Yes, we do. Uh, uh, they have to just go to the tatatrust.org website T A T A T R U S T S. We are probably the only trust which gives uh, uh, support for commercial pilot license. And the one after that, which is called a type rating, which is uh, where you undertake uh, training for flying a specific aircraft. Uh, so they can apply it given by, from the JRD Tata Trust Scholarship. So, right, right. Anyway, so, uh, so Tata Trust, yeah, T R U S T S. Uh, there's another one for you, uh, Ravi Shankar. Will there be any exceptions made for students who are from Mumbai, but have finished their undergraduate degree in Canada and will be continuing their studies, a master's in Canada? And you it's directed to- must have done an undergrad from India. That's mandatory, that's in the trust deed. So I can't do anything with that. Great. Uh, Shyamak to everyone. Sir, uh, is there any scholarship I can get while I'm studying undergraduate in India? So, Farooq Rustamji? Yes, yes, we do have scholarships for undergraduate studies in India. You can apply. Uh, Ravi Shankar? So, we have a, um, but if these are um, identified scholarships. So, we have a medical and healthcare scholarships, and we have a master's in neuroscience. We have a master's in speech therapy. We have a program for aircraft maintenance engineering, and we have a B.Ed. and D.Ed. for Northeast and Jammu and Kashmir. If you don't have a scholarship for engineering students, unless he comes under the poor student category, we have a need-based grant, which is income-based. So where we don't look at merit, simply if a person is from a poor background, we make an exception for engineering. Otherwise, we don't support engineering. But they can take a look at all of our scholarship programs on our website. I think the message I'd like, there are a lot of questions that will be answered if you look at the websites. Yeah. These websites are very comprehensive and all of you need to put in, put in some time to look at these websites. And if you have questions after, uh, after you've looked at these websites, get, uh, they, get back to the panelists or get back to Jasdeep Tatra or to me and we will answer those questions. So, so uh, uh, my daughter wants to go in January to UK as, as the term is starting in February. Could you help her get the scholarship as she lost one year because of the pandemic? Uh, this is from Nancy Faludawala. What advice do the panelists have for her? Is it a one-year master's or a two-year master's? If it is UK, it's likely to be a one-year master's. So Nancy Faludawala? Because if it is Jan February, she's going for spring 21. And I think she has missed the bus for the J.D. endowment. 
my my answer, general answer to Nancy and her daughter is that you have to be very clear. You just can't say, I want to go in January or February. You have to think in terms of the, the semester starting in the fall. And you have to apply at least, one, prepare for this at least one year in advance, not at the last minute. Uh, Delzin Bhagat, can students studying under, under institutional studies like chartered accounting, can they get a scholarship? So do you cover chartered account, uh, account, uh, accountants? No. The answer, Farooq Ustamji, the answer is yes? No, we don't support okay. it. We okay, don't, don't support, support it. Okay, don't support it. Ryan? No, not for us. Uh, Neville? No, not for us as well. Okay. Uh, 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 Aisha Shrock. Uh, you asked a question which I think you can get the answer to by looking at these websites. So I'm going to skip that. Uh, uh, Shyamak, you asked the question, is there scholarships for people studying in India? We've covered that. Uh, okay. Uh, here is a question from uh, Shyamak again. Uh, Sir, I'm currently studying IT engineering in India. Am I uh, applicable? Uh, can, am I eligible for a scholarship? Again, uh, I'd I'd like to ask uh, Farooq Ustamji. Yes, we do. He's studying IT. Yes, we do support. Uh, Ravi Shankar. No, we don't support IT engineering uh, in, in India and diplomacy. Never. Is is this an undergraduate course? Yes, it's a bachelor's course he's looking at. Well, as I mentioned in, in, in my earlier statement that, yes, we do support uh, for, in, for students studying in India. So they can apply to us, but depending on the criteria whether that they are, you know, that the family is financially uh, unable to support them as well. If that's the case uh, for students who are in need, we are, we are there to help in India, for India. Zoroastrian students right. I'm talking about. Uh, our fellowships are exclusively for studying in the US, Indian students going to the US. Uh, Natalie, I'd seen you wanted to say something and I, I, I closed you up. I'm at a good spot right now to have you come in, ask your question, make your statement and then I don't continue. I have a question really. I just wanted to point out, it's not just uh, eight or 10 Ivy Leagues that, that will support um, the tuition cost really for, uh, for students uh, who are admitted. Uh, there's a whole range of about 25 private universities that will do it. One example might be the University of Chicago. It has something called an Odyssey Scholarship, supports tuition in full uh, for, for students. And uh, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology also has some very aggressive support for international students. So it's worth checking with those universities and seeing what their financial aid department can say to you as an applicant to their programs if you get in. And then the other thing to, to keep in mind too about the Ivy Leagues is that if you get admission in one, uh, you're in a pretty lucky spot because you might be able to also get admission in more than one in which case you can get into a bidding war for your, your admission. Uh, whichever university will give you the best financial package. Uh, and that's what something American students go through, finding the best uh, package they can get. But I think it will extend to international students. And this uh, Odyssey scholarship I mentioned at the University of Chicago is intended for diverse students and students who might be the first in their families to go to college so or first to go to higher education so there's kind of a range there of what you could look at that's that's what i wanted to offer thank you so natalie if you could put your email address uh, and and let people know what you can help people with that would be very nice if you'd like to do that okay. uh, uh hi just, uh, if i may if i may yes. But yes. I thought that, you know, if uh, students went to the U.S. consulate and there is a USEFI foundation, you know, which is uh, United States Education Foundation of India, 
which is different from what Ryan is doing. No, actually, Ravi Shankar, yeah. I, am, I am USIEF. Oh, it used to be. It used to be in Safi. Oh. In, in 2008, the Indian government matched the U.S. government in terms of funds, and so we had to okay. change our name to USAFI. Okay. Yes. India Educational Foundation. So, but don't you give information about various colleges and what scholarships I, are available? I, I am the official person to guide students for higher studies oh, in the US. Yeah. Great. So, Dahali, thank you very much. Uh, are there any scholarships for MBA abroad? So, let me ask Farak Rustamji, do you support MBA? Yes, we do support. Great. Neville? Yeah, maybe 30-40% of our applicants are MBA students. So yes. Great. Ravi Shankar? Yeah, we have no discrimination. You can tell what you want to study. Uh, uh, Ryan? This time MBA is not supported, but that again could change depending on the board decisions late December. Uh, uh, Peter Ras has asked, can you provide scholarships for students studying master's degree in the UK? I think you need to do your homework on that. Go and look at these websites and you will get the answers out there. If you don't get the answers, get in touch with Zenar and Karishma and also, uh, also uh, uh, Ravi Shankar and you'll be able to take it from there. Yes, Ravi Shankar. Yes, but see, people who want to go to the UK for a master's, students should know that it's a one-year master's and it is not recognized in India. The University Grants Commission in India does not recognize the one-year master's. It has to be at least 24 months. And I don't think even the US recognizes a one-year master's. So having done a one-year master's in the UK, you cannot do a PhD in India, you cannot do a PhD in the US, unless maybe there is an exception for certain universities. But I think I would advise students to think very seriously before they decided to do, uh, accept an MBA, which is different, but an academic degree in the UK for a master's, they should think before they do that. Um, uh, can I just uh, ask, because uh, there are integrated masters, uh, which are four years for engineering in the UK. So I'm referring to that as the masters, the integrated masters programs. No, you should still check with uh, whether it is eligible under the University Grants Commission in India, or even the and whatever, uh, in the US, it will be each university. If you want to study Outside the UK for your graduate program, you need to check whether it is permissible. Right. Thank you. Uh, 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 this is from Tiara Marshall, and it's to Zenhar in, in particular. And Zenhar and Tiara, you need to get in touch with each other. And uh, uh, Nazneen, uh, anything to add to the conversation that's gone on here, your experience? Nothing as such, but then I think that this is really going to be very helpful for the students out here when the information is just provided for them. And I would tell them to check out online with the universities that they get the admits in. Since a lot of universities even provide scholarships to the students who have uh, got an admit in the course, so you need to check out with your specific universities as well in the US. Great. Uh, 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 Hoshita, would you like to comment? Yes, I would like to say a great presentation, great uh, resource for all students. My advice, I'm looking at the questions in the chat, and I would say, uh, looking at the timeline, students out here, as Ryan mentioned, from 10th grade, a mother who's got uh, twins, it's lovely to see. Uh, please do your research. That is what I would say, going through the full process, is uh, nowadays technology helps doing a Google search, where to find all the panelists have great websites. Please go to them. And if you're looking, it doesn't matter. You should know your end goal, but you should have a brief idea of what you want to do. And I would say a timeline of a good two years of research will help you meet all the deadlines and get your documents in place and, you know, get talking about that. So a person who's here in the 10th grade, you know, uh, a thumbs up to you. You have a good timeline. But yes, as I mentioned, uh, it's a great uh, platform. And if anybody wants help, this uh, faculty network is a great resource. So, yeah, that is it. Great. Uh, uh, Zenhar. 
your advice, your comments. Farzin, uh, your advice, your comments. Oh. Ah, go ahead, Zena. Hi, Farzin. Sorry. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, I'd like to reiterate on what people have mentioned about doing your research, but also understand that you have to go abroad for what you need to go abroad for. Uh, understand that many of the loan schemes are not scholarships, so understand that they will be repayable, and you should respect the honesty and integrity of the people who have given you these loans by looking to repay them as soon as you start earning or as soon as you can, uh, wherever you are in the world. Also understand that uh, you are studying abroad for furthering your career, so the, don't use your scholarship monies or any of the monies that you have uh, I've seen this in the UK because in the UK, the government gives everyone who studies in university a thousand or two thousand pound grant while when doing the undergrads. And then they use it for all sorts of uh, socializing activities rather than academic activities or paying their rent or whatever. So use your monies wisely uh, if you do receive uh, funds. Or, but if it's paid directly to the university, that's the best thing. Uh, so there's no temptation to do that at all. And uh, just just remember that keep your academic grades up and the scholarships usually will follow. Mm -hmm. Great. Farsi, advice to the next generation. I would echo uh, Farouk's uh, opinion about um, edu undergraduate education in the United States. It cost me too much, in my opinion, um, to get my undergraduate degree here um, compared to my counterparts in Canada, for example. Um, I would say apply to a variety of different places and make sure that um, you visit those colleges and make sure that you build connections with people there in that um, university, in that city before you go. So you have a little bit of a support system um, for you when you, when you start your work, because it's going to be a pretty long journey and um, the more people you have on your team, the, the better off you are. Great. Uh, Vesa. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining today. I have two points to make um, for the people who are looking to go abroad for their studies. Uh, the first point is with regard to funding your personal expenses uh, with student jobs or teaching assistantships. Uh, I want to just make it maybe clear that it's a bit harder to support yourself with student jobs in Europe versus uh, maybe America, maybe somebody who studied there can comment about that. But it's, uh, it's quite difficult and almost impossible, if I may say so, uh, to support yourself with student jobs. So I see many students in the US who go there with one year's worth of uh, financing and assume that they can carry forward the second year based on a side job, but uh, that's not possible for uh, Europe. And the second thing that I wish to make the students and parents aware of is that it's important to uh, connect with the university and figure out what the estimated expenses are going to be, uh, living expenses for uh, the time, because it could be that you have some expectation versus the ground reality could be different and then it should not... Uh, uh, hit you like a running train when you finally land there. So I think it's important to align expectations on that front. So, yeah, thanks. Karishma. Three things. When you apply to your first course, keep your trajectory in mind. Develop a strategy. Every step that you take, whether as a parent or as a student, as a team, will reflect upon your further steps in life. First point. The second thing that I want to say is when you apply for a loan and you actually return that loan, you are building a step ladder towards your own success because everything that you do at some point in the future, whether you're applying for a job or you're applying for your next degree is going to come out. Life is going to be an open book as an academic. And that builds immense credibility. So people will ask you questions like, what are your failings? What did you do proactively to plan your trajectory? So I was lucky. My parents helped me a great deal. So I support the parent-student team effort, the student-faculty um, team effort. 
So think carefully about the networks you build around you. Look not just to support yourself, with your parents and your faculty, you will be representing as a student your own faculty from India or wherever you come from. So thank you, Farooq, for helping me address this. Uh, go ahead, uh, Hoshida, you had your hand up. Me, I, I know I had my okay. hand up. <laughs> All right, no so, problem, yes. Please suck this. I had a hand up. Nasreen, sorry, I apologize. Yeah, so basically, Vaisan just uh, spoke about uh, on-campus jobs in the U.S. As you mentioned that over here in the U.S., you do have on-campus jobs. Students cannot work off-campus. They're not citizens. And, uh, and you can actually apply for on-campus even before you could come to the U.S. to the online college websites. And I would recommend for two-year students can do it, but for one-year students, it's really tough to manage academics as well as working on campus. Yes, Ryan. Uh, while I agree with what Nazneem is saying, I would also like to point out that students should not forget what their primary purpose is of being at a university, and that is to study. So rather, if you need the money, yes, but your focus should be on studying and doing well. That's what's going to help you later on. Yes, Ravi Shankar. You see, if you have the money, it's fine. So we can speak about doing what is your passion. But to be realistic, coming from the kind of background that the way at least I grew up, we always needed a plan B. Because a plan A, it's very nice to speak about pursuing passion. It looks like a nice Hollywood story or a Bollywood story. Most lives are not like that. Most lives need a plan B. So if you thought that if I didn't do this, it's the end of my work. I think first thing you should tell all young people who are wanting to study is that nothing is the end of the world. So when I did my MA in philosophy, and I stood first in the university, I was taking my entire life on a future based on my MA in philosophy. I couldn't do it for you know uh, uh, family reasons. I didn't think it was the end of the world. I said, okay, this is my life. I'll try and make the best out of what is now available to me. I think I have seen, I, over the last five years, I've interviewed more than 2,000 students. So I'm going by that experience of having interviewed 2,000 plus students. It's extremely important to understand that while you pursue a passion and with commitment, you should be prepared for a plan B. Life is not a bed of roses. you know. And uh, there's no Amitabh Bachchan will come and rescue you in the 18th reef. Life is not like that. Thank you. Uh, Dolly Dastu, uh, we are now coming to the end. And let me tell you, there, there are a number of uh, things in the chat that uh, I'm not going to answer in this session. We will, uh, we will uh, 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 respond to those, uh, those questions that have been raised uh, in, in, in a document that will be posted on the Z ZFN website. So Dolly Dastu, anything to add? I have just uh, replied to that email. I've, uh, I just sat you with it yesterday and looked at possible scholarships in, uh, it is US, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland. And I've just sent that mail, the document, so people can take a look at that. Great. So Dali Dastu, anything to add? Arzan, anything to add? Okay. If uh, then in that case, Yasdi, could you go to slide 24, please? No, slide 20, 24, go back. Yes, so I'm going to sum no, slide 24, uh, then, yeah. So I'm going to summarize now. Uh, uh, what we have done here is, uh, and this is for Zoroastrians. We're thinking about Yasna uh, 30.2 and uh, loosely this is what it uh, entails. Listen, reflect, and decide in the context of furthering ushta, that's happiness, in our Mazda's kingdom. Listen, very important. Reflect, think. It's easy to ask questions that you can find the answers to 
uh, on, on the web. And then in the context of furthering happiness, that is not just happiness for you, but the happiness for nation, nations. For example, the JN Tata endowment that has been set up is to help the nation move forward. So who do you listen to? You listen to your parents, teachers, and panelists, as Karishma has pointed out. You reflect upon the options available to you. What does that mean? That means you have to generate options. It's not just come along and say, I want to do this. What can I do, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to decide a choice that is right for you to grow as a Zoroastrian and live a Zoroastrian life. I'm horrified to learn that Zoroastrians do not repay their loans. I'm absolutely horrified. I cannot understand how a person who signs and says that I'm going to repay the loan does not do it. This is unethical and it is totally against any principle in Zoroastrianism. And remember that some of these scholarships are Zoroastrian. Now the JN Tata is open to all, the RD Setna is open to all, but the money comes from Zoroastrian people. And so the notion of paying back is very important. The second thing is that we are looking to support people who get, uh, who get an education and then help the community, help the next generation do better. This is extremely important. And we have lots of examples of that. For example, Cyrus Punawala, I went to, you know, uh, Puna, uh, I went to Bishop's school with him. Uh, he's done an incredible amount in terms of making things happen. There are other examples of that as well. So now if you'd go to the next slide, So we now come along, closing remarks, Neville Shroff. Um, thank you very much, Farouk. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to say, and I'm speaking on behalf of Zoroastrians, as you just mentioned as well, because that's where our, our focus and theme is in our trust. Um, I would say to the students, the young people, that do keep your options open. We have, a, we have applicants, uh, part C Zoroastrian applicants applying to, um, study medicine, for example, in Russia, in other places, in, in Eastern Europe law. So there are students studying in, in other countries besides the Western world. Um, from our trust perspective, we take uh, education very ser seriously for many reasons, but most importantly, as our youth, and I'm talking about Zoroastrian youth, you are our future and you are our custodians of our community. And hence, our investment is with you for our future generations. So we depend on you, young Zoroastrians. When you take out a loan, as Farouk was saying, please, we request you to kindly pay back. We need you to, to decide that the degree you are doing is the career path that you intend to take. And that's very important. We can possibly guide you in the right direction, but ultimately, you are the ones who will have to make your own assessment and decision yourselves. Now, personally, I have confidence and belief that each and every one of you have actively will and actively do your due diligence in carefully selecting the course and the university that you do go to. Finally, and most importantly, I think, for each of our young people is that I hope each and every one of you believe in the spirit of giving back to our community, which I think is absolutely vital, as many of our elders are doing today in helping the community back, to get back on its feet. So please, Zoroastrian, Parsis, everywhere, you take out the loan, you take out the scholarship, the grants, do please repay back, and please remember, wherever possible, to give back to the community wherever you can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravi Shankar. Yeah, I just, I just unmuted. So one is that, yes, you should repay. The JNR endowment, the concept. Our investment income is very small. So we depend on our repayment. But that's good so far. Students have been extremely good. Over the last 12 years, I think we are just one default. So I'm very grateful to all the JN Data scholars that they've always repaid. But I just have a word of caution. When you start to study, as that one of the young boys also said, start your homework well in advance. What do you want to study? Because 
the subjects are getting more and more micro enough so there is no subject like molecular biology any longer there is no subject there is systemic biology there is systemic biology there is this biology there is that biology so most students are not aware of the ramification within a broadly defined subject for example there is high energy physics so nobody just studies physics now people study high energy physics or people study cryogenics so having a better understanding of the depth to which the subject has gone into is very useful and it, it there is so much material available on our own website on the jain tata website there are two places that you can look at one is called courses where we cover courses which typically students don't know about second is we have a section called as explore the sciences where we write about physics biology chemistry mathematics neuroscience and statistics exposing the students to the kind of research which is happening in the world and why you can still choose a basic science and lead a very rewarding professional life thank you thank you uh, ryan i'm just going to make two quick points uh, to wrap up the first is for all the students out there is you're going to be hear it over and over again that you're not smart enough you're not good enough you should settle for less and i'm here to tell you don't ever ever give up on your dream if your dream is to study abroad you can make it happen i had an undergraduate student i know there were some who were asking for undergraduate funding she got funding from india from eight different sources so and all those little small amounts of money but together she could fund her studies in the us okay so that's what it is uh and hope that some of the things especially with indians it's very hard to ask for help you all are fortunate that you all have such a very close knit community there are so many people who are willing to help so if you need it just go ahead and ask for help okay? and i wish you all all the best in all your future endeavors great farooq uh thank you farooq i must emphasize here that in our trust we have a single object and that is for funding education promoting higher studies and making good citizens of india and we expect that repayments come to us as planned as scheduled because what you give to us we give back to the society and we we need your support in carrying out the activities of our trust in terms of not only repaying but even after your studies and you get a job you should be offering your services to the trust for mentoring other students and getting them ahead in life as you have gone ahead this is a major factor and we do have a large pool of such experts in different uh, societies and different companies whom we fall back for advice about a student whatever he wants to do so keep in touch with the trust offer your services make your repayments in time and we will support other students 100% and with that i also thank my trustees for the support that they have given me and to the zoroastrian faculty network and to my staff and us pp thawala for helping me prepare the slides and wish you all a very happy future thank you great yes hi i hope you have all enjoyed the program today you will you would have observed that we are providing you a platform where you can get the resources we don't have all the answers but the resources are all available you just need to ask as people have been saying please visit our website at zoroastrianfacultynetwork.org register there there is a free subscription there just enter your email address and you will be able to get all updates on the various programs and webinars that we are having especially on this webinar if you want some feedback etc go back to the website we will be posting the entire presentation as well as all the uh, uh, webinar contents and the videos 
and the responses to all your questions also in a combined document. Thank you and wish you all the best. Thank you. So that comes to me. Uh, I am very grateful. Yes, the click one more time. Oh, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So this brings us to the end of uh, today's uh, webinar. Thank you all for participating. I want to thank the panelists. I thank the panelists and I, I want to recognize Idal Dava and Beram Pastakia uh, who have been instrumental in putting together the, the uh, Zoroastrian faculty network under the auspices of the World Zoroastrian Chamber of Commerce. And uh, with that, we look forward to seeing you uh, 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 next month. And we are planning uh, such uh, uh, webinars uh, once a month uh, in this series. Uh, finally, I'd I want to invite Idol Dava and Beran Pastakia to say a few words on behalf of uh, the World Zoroastrian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, we, will, we will not end uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Zoom site. We will stick around. So those of you who'd like to continue talking to us, uh, please stick around and we will dialogue with you uh, to the extent that's possible. So uh, first, Beram, then Edel. Edel, you'll say the last word. Okay. Well, thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity. I just wanted to say it's fun. It's joyful to be in the group like this, where we are all creating a learning community. And that is progression. That is a progressive community. That is what we stand for. And if we can give back to the world, we become better human beings. And this is just one little piece of that uh, huge uh, mission of life. So thank you, Farooq, uh, all the panelists and all the people who answered uh, this wonderful experience. I really enjoyed being here and hope to continue doing so. Edel? Yeah. yeah. Firstly, uh, thank you, Neville, uh, Ravi Shankar, Ryan, Farooq, Rustamji. Uh, your presentations were very, very informative. And I'm sure the 120 odd students who are attending today benefited uh, tremendously. The students need to understand that this is only a starting point and you have to work seriously with concerted effort to work through the process. It's competitive and demanding and only the best will make it. So good luck to you and thanks for participating. Uh, two points which have been said again and again and I'd like to mention that uh, Please take this seriously when you take the loan, you do pay it back and help your community go forward. One thought for a consideration, a lot of people have said, how do we stay in touch? What do we do? We have a ZFN WhatsApp group and I'm suggesting that maybe those interested uh, with the help of uh, Karishma can join this WhatsApp group and it could be a live way of keeping in touch posting your questions, getting immediate response and learning from each other. So this is a suggestion. And with that, I wish uh, everyone the best of luck and hopefully a lot of you will um, satisfy your dreams and be successful. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'm available uh, by email or Zoom or what have you to respond to queries. If you have a statement of purpose that you wish to me to take a look at, uh, uh, send it to me in Word, include your telephone number, and I will uh, respond to you. All right. So, so, Thank so. Thank you very much, Vero. And Thank wish you. everybody a very Merry Christmas and hope. 2021 will be a very successful year for us all and a healthy year. Good luck. Thank you, everyone. Thank My you. team, all the supporters who helped in putting this program together. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful program. We enjoyed it and presenting it to you as we enjoyed listening to you and answering all your queries. Thank you. Yes, Dan Panabad. Yes, Dan Panabad. Yes, Dan Panabad. I don't know. So, Yasti, you may like to stop recording.
So then we can have a conversation with whoever stays on. May I take leave? I have yes, 